Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Fish from Historic Beverly, and today I will be talking to you about the Hugh Hill portrait that we have in our collection. I will try to let you know when I am about to switch slides, as there may be a slight delay during transitions. We have a number of items in our collection that belong to Hugh Hill, including his spyglass, compass, and other maritime instruments. These were all in his sea chest when it was donated to Historic Beverly by one of his descendants. We even have some of his knee buckles. Now we'll be going to our first slide. Hugh Hill was one of the most active and successful privateer captains of the American Revolution. After the revolution, he brought the same energy and enterprise to become a successful merchant as well. So who was Hugh Hill? Hugh Hill was born in Carrick Fergus in Northern Ireland in 1740. He left home at the age of 15 to enlist as a cabin boy in the Naval Service of England. He deserted the British Navy while in France and came to New England where he quickly obtained work as a sailor, eventually rising to captaincy. He had a younger brother, Peter Hill, who later was a tenant farmer at Hale Farm. Hugh Hill was important for the Revolutionary War cause and especially for Beverly. During the American Revolution, his naval expertise especially in and around the Irish-British coast, became invaluable when he was employed by Andrew and John Cabot as a privateer. Hugh Hill was one of the most successful American privateers. Now, what exactly is a privateer? A privateer is a government-sanctioned pirate ship, authorized to prey on enemy ships, merchant as well as warships. Privateers were often used by many countries in wartime, as few governments had a standing navy, since they were very expensive to maintain. Great Britain is possibly the largest, most powerful standing navy in the 1700s, with France as a close second. The first American privateers were lightly armed, and as so, were instructed to move only against English merchant ships that were barely armed. Uh, this was because they were easy prey compared to British warships. During this time, British commerce suffered due to the American privateer activities. Since the British did not recognize the American government, if captured by the British, American privateers were treated as pirates where the punishment was death. In September 1778, because of his previous successes since the beginning of the revolution, Hill was commissioned a commander and appointed to captain the newly built privateer Pilgrim, which held 16 nine-pounder guns and 140 men. This ship was financed by Moses Brown and Andrew Cabot, who allowed the ship to be built to Hill's design under Hill's own direction. The Pilgrim was the first purpose-built privateer ship in America. And during just one voyage of the Pilgrim, Captain Hill and his crew captured 10 British ships, averaging 150 tons. Hill is credited with at least 40 captures as a privateer captain, a number while in command of the Pilgrim, and later the Cicero. As a Scots-Irish, he hated the English, and he was very familiar with the Irish coast to capture British ships. As one chronicler of the time wrote, he, quote, boldly confronted the lion in his den, end quote. The British called him the notorious Hugh Hill, as he topped the British Navy's most wanted list. Over the course of the Revolutionary War, he captured more than 40 prize ships and helped keep the Continental Army supplied with arms and clothing. One particular incident was mentioned in several different historical accounts, including the book History of Beverly by Edwin Stone. In the waters off the British-Irish coast, 
Hill and his crew were accosted by a British warship. Captain Hill did not feel the condition favorable to engage the warship, so he ran up the Union Jack and pretended to be a British privateer. The British warship captain hailed the pilgrim and called out that he was on the lookout for Captain Hugh Hill of Beverly. Hill responded that he too was looking for Captain Hugh Hill and hoped to come upon him. The ships parted ways. A few days later, when they came upon the same warship, Captain Hill felt the winds to be more favorable. So he ran up the American flag and attacked and captured the British warship. The British captain was most chagrined to find out that he had been outwitted by the notorious Hugh Hill. Hill was known to be generous, courageous, almost to a fault, and as humane to his prisoners as he was terrible to his enemies. He often released the captured ship's crews in other ports away from England, rather than keeping them as prisoners of war. This portrait of Hugh Hill, as you can see here, has a very flat style. This painting, likely made by someone in America, was painted with mineral oil pastels and has the influence of folk style portraiture popular at the time in the early to mid 1800s. Folk style portraits were initially carried out by folk artists that would travel from town to town and paint a person's likeness for much less than a professional artist would charge. Some folk artists could even finish up with three portraits a day with some errors, depending on interest and what their commissioners were willing to pay. Due to their skill level and artistic influences, this would result in flat colors, errors in the proportions of the bodies, and minimal depth. Now we are going to be transitioning to our next image. To give you an idea of what a privateer ship may have looked like, here is a watercolor in our collection it is labeled as the Beverly Privateer Ship 1776. For this slide, we will be going over how a British merchant ship was captured. For this, here is an account of the ship Pilgrim, commanded by Hugh Hill, capturing the British ship Blackpool. The series of events is as follows. The Blackpool was spotted flying the British flag. The mainsail of the pilgrim was hoisted, and Hill was known to say, go get her. The pilgrim shifts its course to intercept the black pool. Hill ordered shots fired across her bow, and then called out to the British ship to heave to and prepare to be boarded. The black pool stopped dead in the water, preparing to receive Hill's jolly boat. The privateers boarded the Blackpool, brandishing cutlasses, while Hill asked for the ship's papers. You are now prisoners of the American Navy, Hill announced. If you vow not to mutiny, we will spare your lives. The British ship was seized and the cargo sold at auction. The ship was renamed, armed, and then became an additional privateer ship. Now we'll be going to our next slide. This telescope is part of Historic Beverly's collections. It, along with a quadrant and other seafaring equipment, was in Hugh Hill's sea chest when it was donated by one of his descendants in the early 1900s. It is an unusually large, for the time, telescope. Enclosed is 37 inches in length. Hill was a huge man for his time, quote, of immense size, muscular beyond the common, as described by L. Vernon Briggs, author of The Cabot History and Genealogy. It has been estimated that Hugh Hill was probably around six and a half feet tall, and he would have easily handled such a large telescope, even on a constantly moving ship. 
Now we'll be going to our next slide. Now this slide is a 1778 authorization from Charles Warren, granting his full share of all prizes that may be taken upon the first cruise of privateer vessel Pilgrim under the command of Captain Hugh Hill. It reads, quote, to the agent of the ship Pilgrim, Hugh Hill Commander, I am pleased to settle and deliver unto Mr. John Tilly, a Boston trader, my full part and share of all prize or prizes that may be taken by the ship Pilgrim during her first cruise, and his receipt shall be your discharge, and in so doing, you will oblige your most humble servant. Witness Barrett Davis Boston, James Tilly, and Charles Warren, October 8th, 1778. Now we'll be going to our next slide. Hugh Hill built his home on Front Street in 1780 using the proceeds from his privateering successes. After his privateering career, Hill owned a shandry on the Beverly waterfront to sell goods to stock ships for their voyages, as well as soap, as well as owning a soap and candle factory nearby. The soap and candle factory building is today 62 Water Street. Hill also bought a wharf in Beverly near his shandry shop and traded with Russia and China. He built a house on Front Street near his wharf and lived there for a time. After a few years, his wife insisted they move away from the waterfront, so he built another house further inland in Beverly. After they moved to the new house, Hugh brought in most of his family from Ireland, including his mother and crippled father, and most of his siblings. Later, even his own son would live at this location. In July 1812, Hugh Hill was part of the delegation to the County of Essex Convention, which met in Ipswich to discuss the United States declaration of war against Great Britain in June of 1812. Most of the representatives to the convention were opposed to both the war and the embargo, which had preceded it for six years. Many of them were import-export merchants or others whose businesses had been greatly impacted by the embargo. Hugh Hill sold shipping supplies and equipment until his death in 1829, at 88 years old. We'll be going to our next slide. This is the Hugh Hill gravesite, which is in the Beverly Central Cemetery. Please keep an eye out on our social media for our next Central Cemetery walk focus on the Revolutionary War soldiers and privateers. Now, if you have any questions, you can reach us at research at historicbeverly.net. All images that are on this presentation are from the Historic Beverly Collection and can be found in our online collection at the link listed on the screen is beverlyhistory.pastperfectonline.com. Please check out our website at www.historicbeverly.net for upcoming events, exhibits, and programs, including children's programs and our walking tours. We have something for just about everyone. You can also follow us at Historic Beverly on Facebook and Instagram. Please check out some of our other spotlight presentations on our YouTube channel and we hope to see you soon at one of our programs.